Okay, the structure of my talk will be as follows, and I have to speak quickly, and I apologize to the non-English speakers in the audience. Uh, it will be, first, I will give an overview of the argument for design, and second, I'll rebut a conceptual argument against design, and I think uh, the re rebuttal will actually clear up some confusions that surround the argument. So first, the sketch of the argument for design. In uh, The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin wrote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find out no such case. Darwin here was trying to do two things. First of all, he was trying to uh, protect his theory from easy dismissal. So he was throwing it on his opponents to prove a negative, to demonstrate that something could not possibly happen, which is effectively impossible to do in science. And the second thing was emphasizing the gradual nature of his theory, that things had to happen very slowly, step by tiny, tiny step. OK. well. Let's take up uh, Darwin's challenge, and, and perhaps we can't demonstrate, but what looks like it might not be able to be put together by numerous successive slight modifications. What type of organ or system or, or so on? And that is one which is irreducibly complex or has the property of irreducible complexity. And in my book, Darwin's Black Box, I define irreducibly complex in, in the following way, as a single system with several well-matched interacting parts. And if you remove one, the uh, system does not uh, function. And I illustrated it with an example from everyday life, a mousetrap. A mousetrap has a number of parts. It's got a holding bar, spring, hammer, and so on. And if you remove one of those parts, it doesn't work half as well as it used to, or a quarter as well as it used to. It's, it's broken. Now, trying to envision the Darwinian evolution of something like this is very difficult. Uh, because uh, Darwinian evolution needs something to be functioning uh, before it can be selected. And I gave a number of examples uh, from the molecular machinery of life that I took to be irreducibly complex. Uh, just one will serve here. This is the bacterial flagellum. This is drawing of a flagellum by the textbook, by a biochemistry textbook by Voet and Voet. And uh, the flagellum is quite literally an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim. It's got a number of parts. It's got something that acts as the propeller, something that attaches the propeller to the drive shaft called the hook region. Uh, the drive shaft is attached to the motor. There's bushing material and so on. If you're missing the hook region, if you're missing the propeller, if you're missing the motor, it's not that it goes half as fast as it used to. Uh, the, the flagellum simply doesn't work at all. And I wrote further that not only is this simply a problem for Darwinian evolution, but it is an argument for design as well. Now, uh, Bill Dembski can uh, give you some mathematical arguments for design. Uh, I'm a, a less mathematical type of person. And let me uh, show, use the following slide to, to see how we apprehend design. Here's a, a far side cartoon. We've got a troop of jungle explorers. And the first explorer has been strung up and skewered. He turns to this guy and says, that's why I never walk in front. Words to live by. Um, now, everybody in this room looks at this cartoon, and you immediately realize that this was designed. How do you know that? You know it because you see a number of parts interacting with each other that would do something that none of the parts by itself wouldn't do. Essentially, you see irreducible complexity. Now, there's a lot of other considerations that go into a, a topic of intelligent design, but I think this gets the idea across. Now, uh, since my book came out, uh, it has been criticized left and right at every level, uh, from the concept of irreducible complexity to the biochemical examples I have used to philosophical and theological arguments. <coughs> and if you want to read any of these uh, uh, critical uh, reviews, just you know, there, many of them are on the internet. Go to an internet search engine, type my name plus any common swear word, and you'll, <laughs> you'll pull up a number of them. <laughs> um, I have responded in a couple of places. I published a, a paper in philosophy of science a year ago. Another paper is coming out in biology and philosophy next year. And I have a series of essays uh, responding to criticisms up on the web at this address. Now, 
the argument for um, design is, is really not a difficult one. If you can illustrate your argument with a far side cartoon, uh, we're not talking quantum physics here. Nonetheless, my book in which these arguments were developed seems to have caught people by surprise and, and therefore has been widely reviewed. And among the reviewers are a number of scientists, molecular biologists and evolutionists, uh, molecular evolutionists and geneticists and so on. And they have had a lot of things to say, but one thing they've uh, more or less agreed on is that the systems I talk about are unexplained and that there's very little in the literature uh, concerning them. For example, let's just look at one quotation from James Shapiro, professor of uh, microbiology at the University of Chicago. He writes, there are no detailed Darwinian accounts for the evolution of any fundamental biochemical or cellular system, only a variety of wishful speculations. And a number of other scientists have said the same thing. Uh, but since uh, these reviews have come out, a number of Darwinists have uh, said that, well, wait a second, we do have lots and lots of uh, papers published that uh, deal with these things. And a, uh, a sample of this is shown in Peter Atkins' review of uh, my book for the Infidels uh, website. And he says that, uh, contrary to my claim, there are hundreds and possibly thousands of scientific papers. And he cites uh, the Talk Origins website as a neutral uh, arbiter of that question. Um, so we have a discrepancy between, say, James Shapiro and other reviewers of my book and, and people, people like Peter Atkins. But for this conference, I think that uh, a good, uh, uh, somebody to, uh, to pay attention to is a man named David Ray Griffin, who's a professor of theology at Claremont uh, University in California. He's written recently in, in a book that uh, he just published, the response I received from repeating Behe's claim about it, the evolutionary literature, which simply brings out the point being made implicitly by many others, such as Crick Denton, Shapiro, Stanley, and so on, is that I obviously have not read the right books. There are, I am assured, evolutionists who have described how the tr transitions in question could have occurred. He continues, when I ask in which books I can find these discussions, however, I either get no answer or else some titles that, upon examination, do not, in fact, contain the promised accounts. That such accounts exist seem to be something that is widely known, but I have yet to encounter anyone who knows where they exist. Uh, my argument is that I think uh, Griffin is correct that most evolutionists, well, that there is not uh, much of a literature on this, that uh, some people will offer you some papers or books or so on, but when you go there, you find that they do not contain the answers to the questions I raised. They might contain answers to other questions, but not to the ones I raised. And it might be of interest to this audience to know that, um, that um, this book by Griffin contains uh, blurb endorsements by a couple of prominent people who are here at this conference. And the first is John Hott, and the second is Jim Miller. <laughs> <coughs> and you'd better listen to what Jim has to say. <laughs> OK. One of my favorite <laughs> And uh, the second part of my talk is a rebuttal of a conceptual argument against design. And the conceptual argument has been advanced by a, a man named John McDonald, who's a professor of biology at the University of Delaware. And the conceptual argument he has advanced is concerns the mousetrap. Now, it might seem silly to some people that one would argue over the mousetrap itself. But I, I think it's actually critical because most people don't have the background to follow detailed scientific arguments. No, not many people are protein chemists. So the argument over the, the mousetrap example makes the argument accessible to a much wider art audience. And if that's thrown into doubt, then those people do not have an independent basis for, for following the argument. So uh, McDonald's argument is this. He said that, well, in my book, I showed a five-piece mousetrap with a catch, spring, hammer, hold down bar and platform. But he says, he can make a mousetrap with just four pieces. If you take away the catch, now if you just move the hold down bar over here and tuck it underneath the extension of the hammer, now if the mouse comes along and nibbles the cheese, this might dislodge and he might be unlucky enough to have his tail or something caught there. It would attach to his tail. He wouldn't be very successful getting food or finding a mate. 
and um, therefore it, it would work as a, as a mousetrap. And he says further, he can make a three-piece mousetrap. Now you take away the hold-down bar, and the hammer over here is now uh, resting against the edge of this platform. If a mouse comes along, he might jiggle this. This would go down. It's under tension going down this way. Again, a paw or a, uh, an arm or something like that, uh, or a tail might get caught, and uh, he would be trapped. But, he says, he can make a two-piece mousetrap. Now he's got the spring, the edge of the spring is over here, and the same idea, the mouse comes along, jiggles it, his tail or paw gets caught there. But yes, yes, a one-piece mousetrap. Here it is. These things are opposed, resting on each other, so that if the mouse comes along, bumps things, this one comes down, uh, lands close to this crossbar, again catches a tail or a paw. So he says, although I said you need a five-piece mousetrap, he can make ones with, with fewer pieces. But on his website, he says something curious. He said, the reduced complexity mousetraps below are intended to point out the logical flaw in the intelligent design argument. They're not intended as an analogy of how evolution works. Well, what does that mean? Why aren't they intended as an analogy of how evolution works? And if they're not, what, what's their use? What is this logical flaw? Well, uh, the logical flaw that uh, McDonald thinks he sees is that I used a five-piece mousetrap, but he can use one with, with less. And to that, I would just say that uh, I heartily agree with him. Uh, that's certainly true. And as a matter of fact, I, I said so in my book. Oh, gee. Okay. I wrote, we need to distinguish between a physical precursor and a conceptual precursor. The trap described above is not the only system that can immobilize a mouse. On other occasions, my family has used a glue trap. In theory, at least, one can use a box propped open with a stick that could be tripped, or one can simply shoot the mouse with a BB gun. However, these are not physical precursors to the standard mouse trap, since they cannot be transformed step by Darwinian step into a trap with a base, hammer, spring, catch, and holding bar. So the question is whether they are physical precursors or conceptual precursors. And it's certainly true you can make uh, mouse traps, you know, hundreds or thousands of different ways. But the question is, can you get to the mouse trap we see? And in fact, uh, we can't. And I'll show you the problem a little bit later in his, uh, in his um, website. He writes, the first step in reducing the complexity of a mouse trap is to remove the catch. Okay. The hold down bar is then bent a little so that it will catch on the end of the hammer that protrudes out from the spring. This end of the hammer might need a little filing to make the action nice and delicate. Well, what's wrong with this picture? This is John McDonald, intelligent agent, designing a mousetrap. But we know that intelligent agents can make irreducibly complex uh, systems. The question is, can Darwinian processes do so? So uh, it turns out that intelligence uh, is, saturates the whole process that he talks about. And to show you that, let me take a look at a couple of his examples. Let's, he's, he went from the five-piece trap to the one-piece. Let's go the opposite way, which is how Darwinian evolution would be expected to work. This is his one-piece mousetrap. This is his two-piece mousetrap. The first thing to notice is that this is a rather peculiar spring. I'm nearly 50 years old. I've never seen a spring like this in my entire life. Uh, the ends of it are designed or, uh, or have to be in an exact relation for them to uh, be effective. If this, uh, this arm was a little shorter, if the angle wasn't quite correct, it simply wouldn't work. It's an intelligently chosen starting point. Okay, you have to start somewhere. Okay, so we'll give him this. What happens, how do we get from here to here? Do we simply put this on top of the, uh, of the uh, platform? No, you can't do that. The first thing to notice is that the arms here are in a different relation than they are here. This arm here has been rotated about 90 degrees. This has been rotated about 180 degrees and shortened as well. So you can't just put the one on the other. You can't go from here to here. Rather, you have to have an intelligent agent manipulating the trap to get to this relationship here. Okay, in this one, here they were, uh, the spring was under tension because the two arms were resting against each other. Why is it under tension here when they're not? Well, <laughs> why isn't this just kind of flopping around on the wooden platform? Well, it turns out, barely visible here, there are two staples, here and here which are necessary to hold the spring down so that it can be under tension. So we have not gone from a one-piece to a two-piece trap. We've gone from a one-piece to a four-piece trap. 
Notice also that the positioning of the